thank you for the invitation, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, just uh, two words about myself, um, and that is I am from Poland. I left Poland in 61. I returned to Poland 30 years later in 91. I've been in Poland since that time. I'm a banker for over 45 years. And um, I'm very happy to say that I was very, in a way, fortunate not only to witness what was happening in Poland, but also to be, uh, to play a part, a role in the transformation, transformation of uh, banking sector, financial sector, mainly banking sector. So maybe a few words about that. Um, needless to say, when I came to Poland in 91, um, I realized that even though we had so many banks, there were, there were nine banks, commercial banks created out of National Bank of Poland. But in fact, we didn't have any banks at all in Poland. These were financial institutions. Um, and it was amazing to see how within a few years, from 89, although the transformation started, I have to say, even before that, uh, two, three years. So within a few years, we saw that the regulations have changed. We also had the... Um, uh, regulators body today is the Commissa uh, KNF, um, Commissa Nadzori Finansowego. Also, we created the Warsaw Stock Exchange. Um, the whole country went into something that very few people or very few areas, um, business areas, really understood what was happening. And uh, notions like, for example, corporate governance were unknown until some years ago. I'm not talking about 20, 30 years ago, but maybe like five, seven years ago. We did not know how to translate corporate governance into Polish. It was really very difficult to explain what this is all about, uh, and it took us some years to, to really uh, develop that. Today, we all are using, uh, and not only using this approach, but actually by implementing uh, not only in the banking sector, but everywhere in Poland, the notion uh, rules and, and, and the govern, uh, govern corporate, um, corporate governance. We also had like uh, the CSR, corporate social responsibilities. Also, very few people understood what that meant. And was it necessary? Today we have index respect already, even today. Not too many people understand what this is all about, although it's quite popular in other countries. It's getting more and more popular in, in Poland, and there are already, I think, more than a dozen companies that are uh, part of that uh, index and use it. So when we talk about trans transformation, it's not only the technology transformation, uh, but I think that mainly it's the mentality transformation. And this is what I would like to really concentrate on. We are talking about computers, we are talking about the fact that uh, it was a cash society in Poland, and then everybody thought in 1991, 92, when I arrived, they said, well, most likely we're going to do what happened in the States. We'll have checks, and then we'll have plastic cards, and then we'll have maybe like in 20 years from now, credit cards, and so on and so on. We skipped the second stage. We went from cash to plastic right away. That's, that's, that's the uh, transformation, and Polish management people were able to really um, take this challenge upon themselves, and, and it was a frog leap in that respect. But mentality, I remember very well where, this is something that actually um, I'm still thinking about and feel uncomfortable about it, because in the 90s, we somebody said that in order to build a new financial order, uh, banking sector properly, we have to rely on young people. Young people, that means age 20 to 30 maximum, okay? Because that meant that they don't know much about the communist, socialist rules. They feel free, they, they are you know, full of energy, ambition, and so on, so on. So, and that was true, except that we really put a cross on hundreds of thousands, even maybe, I'm talking about the, uh, the whole nation, millions of people who were over 40, over 50, 
saying, you are not good enough for the new order. That was very cruel. We thought at that time that was necessary, otherwise we will not go through this revolution, evolution. Uh, so if I had to do it again today, I definitely would not go into this extreme as I had done it uh, before. So mentality, I'm talking about Mr. Kowalski. I remember cases where um, some youngsters, they were coming to me with tears and they said, I don't really understand how to go about it. So I asked my parents, who used to work in a bank for the last 20, 30 years. And they said, we are the bankers from the 70s, 80s, and so on. And when I told them what you are telling us, what we need to do, we need to introduce valuation of risks, of assets, matching uh, short-term uh, uh, liabilities and, and short-term assets, and so on, so on. They did not know what, what I was talking about. So my parents felt very uncomfortable, and they said, who is this maniac who came from the States and telling you all kinds of things? You know, we never heard of that. So these youngsters had really a problem because they did not have their parents to help them. And they really had to start on their own, and that was a very courageous behavior. I must say that this is... And therefore, it is not surprising today, we have fantastic, fantastic group of managers. Today, Polish managers, banking sector, okay, are just as good as managers in banking sector any other country. Look at the things that we have developed. You can make a transfer within seconds from one account to another, if not within minutes or hours. I had problems when I sent money from Poland to Citibank to send it to Chase Manhattan Bank. And, and, and the customer at Chase Manhattan Bank received this only after two, three days. Okay? When I said, what's, what's wrong with you? you know, I'm in the United States and this kind of system. Here it's a question of hours, because, and now even question of special payments of seconds when this is done. So, um, risks. People did not know how to evaluate a risk that we are dealing with, that we live with in the banking sector. And it was very difficult to, ex to explain that, uh, what that meant, and how to evaluate also the worth of companies. When I mentioned that your job is to create value, added value to a corporation. So they said, well, you know, what does it mean? We have to have more customers. We have to do more of what we have been doing so far. I said, no. We have to do with fewer people, much more, and we have to measure now the things. So we introduced such a thing like MBOs, Managing by Objective Systems. A shock. How are you going to measure that? You're going to really say that I am good, or I am not good, and so on. This was something very new. Transformation. Mental transformation for these people. And it took us some years to really uh, implement that, explain this is something that has to be measured, that has to be agreed upon by you and me. So it's not only that it's coming from the top. Taking decisions. We know very well that actually, and I have written about it many, many times, um, managing people, which means you have to let your employees be free, to feel free. And I would have to be free to express themselves. They have to be able to speak up without being afraid. Once this is done, this is not for the banking sector, this is for everyone. Once this is done, this individual says, I am good enough, two minutes, okay? I am good enough now to take decisions. So you have to allow them to do that. You have to prepare them to that. And then, when they do this, the third stage is, is now, what about my career path? I want to be someone. I don't want to be in the same position for five, 10 years. And the conclusion of that was, you are behind the wheel, driving it. You are the ones to decide about your life. Don't wait until Joseph Wanzer decides whether he likes you or not and say, okay, you're going to be a manager or you will never be a manager. You have to decide what to do and so on. So again, people are the most important assets. We heard about it, but this is true. And I only want to congratulate the whole nation, all the people who went through this very difficult, challenging mentality transformation. Thank you. It's actually 25 years ago
this summer that I first arrived in Poland uh, with some knowledge of Western Europe and I'd also been to the USSR. In the last quarter century, I've served in several different countries, but between our departure from Poland in 1989, when it was still a communist system, falling apart, but still communist, and our return to Poland just three short years ago, Poland has undergone an amazing, extraordinary, and on the whole, highly successful transformation. It's incredible. It's very humbling to follow Joseph Vancer on a panel, and it's even more risky maybe for me to disagree in a small way with him, but maybe it's just a matter of how we word it. I think that the greatest transformation is not actually a transformation of mentality exactly. It's that the Polish spirit that was always there was finally released, was finally unchained. The potential was unleashed, and that's what caused the flood of changes that we've seen, technological changes, socioeconomic changes, and the changes in mentality that Joseph referred to. So I think, and this is a little bit risky too for me as a foreigner with only 25 years of experience thinking about Poland, to tell Polish people, but it's deep in Polish history. The, the factors that led to the successful transformation here in Poland and missing in other countries has caused those transformations to be less successful. We're always here and they're deeply rooted in Polish history. And I'd like to cite three factors. We can debate them. I don't have all the answers, but I, I think that these, are, these three factors are crucial. Poland has always had and still exhibits very strongly today the entrepreneurial spirit and the spirit, the culture of risk taking. Second, Poland has always been, and more so than ever today, an international country. And the third, Poland, Poles, think big. Let me go back and explain a little bit more what I mean. The entrepreneurial spirit. We saw it when we lived here in the gray and dismal 1980s when the communist system was grinding down to the very bottom, but Poles somehow were still getting along and some people were even enjoying life. How did they do it? It was through tremendous creativity, risk taking, because mu much of the economic activity that worked in those days was, let's face it, illegal or outside the system. So Poles knew how to operate, amazingly adept, at circumventing stupid rules and, and a system that was clearly uh, outmoded if it ever made any sense. But I think that it went back, and if you read Polish history, it went back before the communist period when Poland was not free before the First World War. During the partitions, Poles were, if you read historical accounts of what was going on in the different parts of what is Poland today, Poles were circumventing the rules even then and the stupid restrictions that other countries were imposing on Poland. So there's a centuries-long tradition of making things happen in spite of the rules, figuring things out for yourself, for your family, for your small community. And this is a tremendous strength that Poland brought to the transformation. So when it was allowed to do things, when it became legal to do what made sense, when markets reappeared, there was freedom, finally, then Poles were ready to take advantage of it. So it wasn't so much that the mentality had to change completely, but that that potential was then unleashed. Another factor, the second, Poland was always an international country. The Poland of today with whatever it is, very high percentage of people uh, who are ethnically Polish or identify themselves as Polish is an anomaly historically. Historically, Poland has been a very diverse country. Jews, Germans, Ukrainians, Lithuanians. This has been a country where uh, there were a tremendous amount of shared traditions, and this kept the spirit of inquiry and curiosity and openness alive in this country. Again, if you read historical accounts of what was happening in Poland during the, the years of the, the great uh, Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, then in the 18th century, and during the times of the of the partitions as well. Poland had all kinds of influences from all kinds of different countries. 
combined with the great number of Poles who went and lived in other countries and brought those experiences back to the country. So, um, and this is something I experienced during the communist time to my, to my pleasant surprise, uh, working at the embassy in Warsaw, how many Poles under those miserable circumstances had actually traveled? Poles love to travel. They had passports. They went places without any money. They somehow managed to get this international exposure. So Poland has always been and is now more than ever a very open, uh, internationally minded place. And this aided tremendously, I think, in, in Poland's transformation when it became possible in the 90s. And the last, uh, I think that Poles think big. I'd like to cite two examples of people that I know personally that I admire tremendously. One is <coughs> Maria Zimionov. I don't know if you know her. She's the doctor from Poznan who went to the States some 15 years ago maybe, and she had did the first complete face transplant in medical history. President Komorowski went and visited her at the Cleveland Clinic where she works. Tremendous lady. It didn't stop her that this was a communist country and she didn't have any money or any connections. She studied uh, she, at the frontiers of medical science and she's only one of many examples of similar Polish scientists and scholars who just thought big. They were at the, the top of their uh, field and they have succeeded whether they stayed here in Poland or went abroad, it doesn't matter, but Poles think big. Poles can accomplish anything if they put their mind and energy to it. Another example, probably less well-known, is one closer to me, a California winemaker by the name of Pavel Lato. I don't know if you've heard of Pavel, but his wine cannot be bought in stores. Only in the most exclusive restaurants and high-end auctions can you find the wine that's made by this guy six generations of beekeeping in Yenjeyev, in Sventokshiske is his origin, but he was a Pole who was interested in wine, went to France with no money at all, studied winemaking, went to Canada, went to the States, lived outside a winery, slept in his truck, studied how to make wine, and now he's absolutely one of the finest winemakers in California. Again, thinking big. These three factors are what I see after 20 years of looking back as what it was that made it possible for Poles and Poland to seize that opportunity when the transformation um, began some 20 years ago and has brought Poland to where it is today. Congratulations. Democracy and politics are not actually the same thing because apart from politics itself understood as the battle of political parties and the ins and outs of political debate, democracy is actually made up of a much broader construct of um, institutions, um, behaviors, and so on in society. And I think it is fair to say that in many of these areas, Poland has made, obviously, remarkable strides. Um, if, you, if you see the whole um, democratic uh, processes involving things such as an independent civil service. That's obviously been a huge achievement with the establishment of the independent um, civil service college in Poland in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the 1990s. Um, a, a vibrant civil society, I think, is a, is a very important component of what we would see as a successful democracy. And certainly in Poland, that's the case. I mean, this institution that we're gathered in today, I think, is a splendid example of a non-governmental sector uh, initiative that has a uh, tremendous impact on, on the local community. Um, local government, of course, is, is I think one of Poland's great successes over the last 20 years. Um, the government of Jerzy Buzek uh, from 1997 till 2001 was at, at, at the time much maligned but I think in retrospect, people now see it as one of the, perhaps the most reformist administrations of the last 20 years. And one of the great reforms that Mr. Buzek um, implemented during his time was a radical decentralization of power in Poland. That's always good for encouraging local initiatives, local democracy. And um, 
other areas are equally successful. I think um, the plague of corruption that um, undermined Polish politics for the first decade, I think, has been put, put to rest. I mean, there are obviously scandals here and there, but I think the, the old style um, grand corruption schemes that, that um, were around in Poland for the first 15 years or so of, of post-1990 politics are uh, are largely history there, but that's always uh, famous, famous last words, as they say. And I think the regulatory environment of, of independent regulators who look at aspects of, of, um, uh, of like the, the, the human rights ombudsman and so on, these, these are tremendous um, achievements. If we then narrow it down, however, into the, um, the, the world of politics itself, understood as um, party politics, politicians, elections. Here things, I'm afraid, are, are perhaps a little less rosy. Uh, and of course, in one sense, there have again been you know, positive changes. I mean, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, in Poland, party politics were, was a kaleidoscope of, of initiatives, politicians, parties. It was very difficult to form coalitions. Now, broadly in Poland, you would sort of do have a traditional bipolar political system. Um, it's not quite left and right in the sense that we would recognize it in the United States or Great Britain, but nonetheless, people in politics, people in, in Poland now do have a, a, a clear choice when they go to an election. They can broadly vote for two quite different visions of, of politics as, as characterized by um, civic platform and law and justice. There are obviously the the smaller parties um, in the background, but broadly the political debate in Poland is crystallized around two, uh, a, a choice of two ways forward. And I think that's always healthy, healthy in a democracy. Um, on the other hand, I think there has been um, uh, a decline uh, in what I would consider to be what a healthy democracy ought to be aiming for in terms of party politics. And I think the greatest um, uh, clear decline has been in the quality of Polish political elites. Uh, you have to really have been in Poland 20 years ago to, to see that um, the thrust of reform in Poland in the first half of the 1990s was led by people who actually really solidly believed in a public mission and in the value of ideas and had a real drive to reform the country. They actually took politics seriously. People like uh, Professor Leszek Balcerowicz, uh, Prime Minister Mazowiecki, uh, the, the people who came from the dissident underground who were actually informed by values rather than material interests were a very important part of the political scene for the first decade or so of Polish politics. They, they took Poland into NATO um, in, the, in the late 1990s. And they actually thought there was something more important than short-term political careerism. And I think, unfortunately, over the last decade, perhaps, you've seen a shift into a, a political class which is much more short-term minded, much more prone to perceive politics as the art of public relations, poll watching, um, shifting uh, policies at a drop of a hat, and, and, and really a focus on um, short-term interests, which is slightly driven by the Polish electoral system, which does tend to generate politicians, especially in parliament, who are, frankly, by any um, Western standards, uh, second rate in terms of competency and ability and so on. So I think that's one unfortunate um, change. And I think that is reflected in the low participation rates in elections. If you look at the statistics, usually at a general election or a local election, less than half or just about half of polls actually go to participate. And there must be a reason for that. And I think one of the reasons is that they do perceive the political class as, dis as, as un unsatisfactory from their um, uh, perspective. I did mention earlier the, the polarization of the political scene into two broad camps. Now, if we, if we come from the United States or from the UK or from Western Europe, this debate, this polarization is usually around left to right. Um, we have a spectrum of views, um, socialism uh, to free market liberalism. In Poland, unfortunately, these categories are jumbled together, and they have been for the last 20 years. Initially, 
the division in Polish politics was whether you were a, an ex-communist or a ex-solidarity politician. Now, over the last few years, that polarization uh, along current lines is really about a, a, I won't go bore you with the details, but it's about different narratives of what the last 20 years involved in Polish politics. And we don't have, at the moment, a clear choice of policy when we go and vote. You will find socialists and free marketeers in both the main leading parties, law and justice and civic platform. Um, you will find conservatives and liberals in both. And it's very difficult in that sense to actually say that Poland has a normal um, political system. The, 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 the other area which I think is, is has, um, to be frank, um, undermined Polish democracy is the impact of Europe, and Polish membership for the European Union. Um, it's a historical inevitability, perhaps, but I think we now see um, increasing areas of, of policy and um, regulation being driven by uh, what happens in Brussels and the European Parliament and the European Commission. And the Polish Parliament today is very much an institution which merely transposes into Polish law um, regulations and decisions which are taken elsewhere without much democratic debate about whether those policies are wrong or right for the country and the current um, <coughs> issue of climate change policy I think is, a, is, is very important. And I think we've also seen as, we, as with the Euro crisis, uh, the Polish government is being increasingly locked out of the main decisions which are being taken in Europe within the Eurozone country. So there is a, I think, an increasing democratic deficit, uh, which was certainly not the case in uh, 10 or 15 years ago, where, for better or worse, the Poles were much more in charge of their own destiny, perhaps, than they are um, today. Just very, very finally, uh, I did mention um, that democracy is more about just voting or political parties. The other great pillar of democracy is the rule of law. And I think this is another area where the Poles are still struggling, frankly. I think the Polish judicial system is, is, is relatively weak compared with what it, what it perhaps could be. Um, court cases notoriously drag on for years. There's very little lack of clarity about uh, law. Judges are perhaps not as competent as they could be. And I think the Poles are still struggling whether or the degree to which the judicial process should be under political control. This is obviously a uh, debate which goes back to the founding fathers of the US Constitution and the and division of powers and so on. And I think the very recent debates that we've seen about the uh, structure of the Prosecutor General and his relationship to the Ministry of Justice uh, is, is an example that this debate has not yet fully played out in Poland to the extent it has in other mature democracies. So there's, 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 I think on the, uh, sorry to put a damper on the proceedings, but um, there is, I think, if, in many cases, a long way to go for Poland. But perhaps that is an encouragement for those politicians who do have a, a broader vision of politics to pick up the uh, banner of um, freedom and democracy where it so bravely flew uh, 20 years ago in Poland in the first place. It's interesting because I think from an overall perspective, I, I've noticed the media does this as well, is that they refer to Krakow or even a lot of the major cities in, in Poland as being kind of uh, sources of lots of outsourcing jobs. And I always take a bit of an issue with that because I think that, um, and this is a technical element uh, definition thing, but outsourcing, generally speaking, is when you take certain business processes and you send it to somebody else to manage it. So those people are not your employees. Whereas shared services is actually where you basically take certain business processes, you keep it inside of your company, but you basically expand to new locations. And I think that outsourcing generally is a start point because obviously it's tied very much to cost, but shared services is actually based on cost versus quality. And that's an important distinction to make as we talk about Krakow and as we talk about Poland, because I think that in many ways, the story may have began with the discussion around outsourcing, but it's actually becoming now more of a discussion around shared services, around R&D, around IT development. And, these are the, and this is the way the conversation should ideally evolve. Because if you look at the last, for example, 20 years, uh, the foreign direct investment that came in 
I would say, largely speaking, was taking advantage of the cost opportunity. Um, and that's natural, because when you look at multinationals, they only have a certain amount of capital to invest. And from a, a trust and risk perspective, because people always kind of discount that, people think that it's just about looking for the cheapest location. But as we know from a lot of places in the world, there are places that are unstable. And as a result of that, there's a risk factor that has to be taken into account. Um, and for example, when you think about R&D, the family jewels of most companies, this is something that requires a tremendous amount of trust because before you deploy that into locations, you want to trust that these are places that you believe you can do business over the course of a decade or two decades. And so as we look at the early investments, I th I'd say that they were just opportunistic uh, in a very positive sense because this is capitalism at the end of the day. But as you started to see companies come here and come away with very positive experiences, you started to see the evolution of the environment up the value chain, as they say in the tech world. So if I look at like early adopters, I think in using the Krakow case, Motorola, I think, came in 1998. And I would say they, they really bet big. I think that there were a lot of advocates both in the country but also in the company talking about the fact that there was really good quality talent here that should be leveraged within the company. Um, and they had tremendous growth. Um, and, and when I look at or 1998 forward, you really started to see an acceleration. And that's based on, again, you had the first adopter taking away good, very good stories. And as a result of that, you had other people that were early adopters, not maybe on the, on the cutting edge, but early adopters that thought, well, maybe we can do that as well and we'll start small and see where it goes. Um, and if you looked at a lot of the companies that have moved in in the last five to seven years, very often they thought, well, we'll come in with about 50 people, 100 people, and we'll see how it goes. Uh, State Street, um, now in Krakow, they're at about 1,000 people and they want to expand to 1,600 people. They wanted to come in with a few hundred people. That was it. Uh, Sabre, they started in, uh, I think, 2004. They acquired a very small company, uh, and they started with about 15 people, and now they're over 1,500 as well. So when you look at it, they had to establish the personal experience associated with getting a center up and running, see the value associated with that, and then make the investments. And then other companies started to kind of, again, ride on the shoulders of the giants. So Cisco actually just came in quite recently, last month, and actually now two months ago. And again, one of the major factors there was the fact that look at the ecosystem. It's just incredible. Um, one of the factors that I think is quite unique in Krakow is the fact that a lot of the multinationals actually uh, speak to each other. This is, believe it or not, this is actually, you would think quite a normal thing, but actually it's not. It's, uh, it, it's quite exceptional. And as a result of that, it makes it a very attractive environment. But where do we go from here? I think that there's lots of perspectives on where it will go. Um, I'm fortunate enough to actually have a lot of ties into the startup community as well. Um, in 1999, there was one venture capitalist in Krakow. Today, there's arguably five or six, plus angel funds, plus incubators. This is incredibly important for the development of not only the, the multinationals, but also for the actual talent of the, of the students and the entrepreneurs in the, in the society. And obviously, this is only one aspect. This is the technical aspect. I think that when you look at entrepreneurs in retail, starting new companies in the services sector, these are other expressions of, I would say, the entrepreneurial spirit that Alan was referring to. And um, even today, I, I would say in the last year, uh, last, actually in the last November, we had the first Silicon Valley investment into a company that was actually started in Krakow. And those ties, that trust I'm talking about with regards to believing the talent is here, believing the potential is here, are really expanding. And we're starting to see lots and lots of people going back and forth. And that ecosystem is critical. Because when you think about it, the multinationals are part of an evolution, but if you don't have the universities, if you don't have the entrepreneurs creating companies that actually either partner with or eventually get acquired by big companies, um, you miss out on that thing. And so many cities across the world um, really aspire to actually achieve that level of creation of an ecosystem, of having that level of talent, and building that level of trust with multinationals with governments outside of the home country because I think that's ultimately the evolution is that the multinational headquarters or sites that are actually in Poland 
are essentially reflections. They're just global centers. They're not cheaper locations. They're, value, they're locations where you have great value, so they're cost competitive, but you're actually getting a lot of extra value out of, as a result of that. But most importantly, you're cre they're, they're part of a global ecosystem, and that's this value add that people talk about. Those are the jobs that are more difficult to actually remove because they're actually, the, the value is in the heads of the people. And that's where I see it evolving, is that we move away from, let's say, just plain vanilla outsourcing, and it evolves more directly into things that are very specifically tied to the human potential and the human capital that the region represents. And it's not just about Krakow and employing people from Krakow or from Katowice or from Poland. If you look at really the most successful places like Silicon Valley, specifically from a tech space, these are really just melting pots of the international world. Um, and I think that's ultimately what can be aspired to is that Poland actually returns to its roots as that. So that's my perspective. When I left Poland in 1989, I never thought I'd see anything like this. So I think I'm probably the worst person to answer what Poland will look like in 20 years, having done such a bad job of predicting 20 years ago. However, there are a few things that are sort of inevitable. I think that uh, globalization and the greater integration of Poland into Europe is inevitable. And I think that the um, increasing number of immigrants into Poland um, the internationalization of the Polish population is also inevitable if you look at demographic trends that I think will be pretty difficult to reduce or even slow. So Poland will have a very different ethnic makeup 20 years from now, and it will be a much more international country than it is even today. I think that's safe to say. And beyond that, I'm not going out any further. I just recently read an article from uh, written by HSBC, I believe, and they said that uh, in 20 years from today, Poland will be the largest exporter in the world. And that is because, the, because due to the dynamic growth of exports, and they assume that this is going to be continued, so 5 6%, whatever that is, it's going to continue, and therefore we're going to be uh, the number one in 20 30 years from today. Uh, unfortunately, not everything is always um, uh, fixed as we would like to. So, um, but whatever it is, the fact that there are organizations thinking that Poland has the ability and potential is already very encouraging. I would say that um, 20 years from then, I would rather talk about the financial sector than in terms of politics. Um, I would see that there were going to be fewer banks, very few, uh, but there will be also smaller banks, like everywhere in the world, so that we will not have a case of too big to fail. Um, there will be specialized banks, and, um, and more banking will be done, or the weight of banking will be more shifted into, into Asia and, and uh, Africa, uh, South America and then in Europe. Europe is going to be uh, a different Europe, which means that we are going to have sort of like United States of Europe and Poland will be a part of that um, and we'll be very happy. Nobody in 1990 could have foreseen what Poland looked like in, in 2010, so it's Perhaps even more difficult to see what Poland will be like in 2032, apart from, well, perhaps we would have staged the World Cup and have been knocked out by Belarus in the first round and still hoping for uh, future successes. Um, but on a serious note, I think the future of Poland in 20 years' time is perhaps a little out of Poland's hands, actually, because I think it, the future of Poland in the next two decades will be driven by what happens in Europe over the next two years. Um, and without getting into our, you know, the, the debate about the <coughs> huge debate about the future of the euro and so on, but there are really two options ahead of Europe. One is that the solution to the um, current economic crisis will involve some sort of very strong federalization of Europe, 
involving uh, essentially the creation of a single um, state with a single currency, a single monetary board, a single taxation system, uh, and, and a single polity. And, and that is on the agenda, frankly. And Poland's, um, I think, position will be determined whether she is part of that or she is not part of that. I think one of the big challenges, one of the uh, terrible dilemmas facing Poland is that if Poland were to find itself inside this future Euro state, um, it will, by definition, have to succumb to the swathe of regulations um, which on areas such as energy, um, climate, CO2 emissions, taxation especially, threaten to undermine the competitive advantage that the Polish economy has had um, over the last 10 to 15 years um, and um, inevitably um, would, personally I feel it's inevitable, would lead to a driving out of significant um, foreign investors from Poland as a result of those increased costs. So I think that's a, a huge challenge to Poland. The alternative, of course, is being left out of that Eurozone and being part of a new architecture of Europe <coughs> whereby Poland will perhaps be alongside countries such as the United Kingdom, Scandinavia, one or two southern countries who find themselves out of this Eurozone and will be faced with huge policy challenges of um, organizing their relationships with Europe with the United States, but being freer internally to perhaps in many ways to maintain some of the re regulatory environment that has allowed Poland to be so competitive um, in the past and has been the source of Polish growth. And they, no, no, none of those, either of those two scenarios are easy. Both are, in fact, incredibly politically challenging. And I think what the Polish politics will look like <coughs> Uh, internally in 20 years time will be a function of which choice Poland makes to be inside or outside uh, the newly um, emerging uh, federal Europe. Sure, I think that in, in the greater scheme of things, I, there's, there's lots of different ways it could actually play out, but I think there's found foundational fundamentals that ultimately will influence the direction it goes. Uh, to Marek's point, I think that the government element is critical, where Poland positions itself on the world stage. Um, but at the same time, I think that that's almost the foundation element, and then how the house gets built is the piece that actually has to be driven um, in many ways by the actual evolution of business and the innovation that happens in the country. Um, there's two books, I think, that are quite interesting. One is called The Next 100 Years by George Friedman, um, in which Poland actually becomes a superpower. Uh, some would argue that science fiction. We'll, we'll see what the, the case actually is, but it has some very interesting points talking about um, those foundational elements. Um, another one is uh, called Startup Nation, which is actually about Israel. But I think that when I look at the elements associated with really Israel's emergence of the world scene as a high-tech kind of superpower in its own, I think there's elements of that that really Poland could take away from it and try to understand those things and encourage that kind of innovation. Because if I look forward 20 years, I don't see any reason why um, Poland uh, and certain cities within Poland can't actually reach a level of innovation and bridges between other countries, other cities, um, to really become hubs of innovation. And, and I would say there's a personal aspect to that as well, because I have three children, uh, and they have U.S. and Polish passports. And when you actually think about, fast forward to when they're actually in university and finishing and deciding where they want to live, they could easily live in New York City, Chicago, or Silicon Valley, for that matter. But my personal belief is that Krakow, and probably other cities in Poland, will be attractive enough that rather than choosing to migrate somewhere else, maybe they'll convince their cousins to move to Krakow. So, obviously, I, I have a very <laughs> long-term view of it, but I really believe that that's the potential that Poland represents. I'm more uh, optimistic and positive on, on the future, and the fact that the uh, future of Poland depends on other countries has always been the case. Uh, that's, that's history. Yeah. Um, however, there were so many notions that Poland is not going to make it uh, for the last 20, 30 years. And yet, uh, in most cases, uh, these people were not found uh, to be correct. Um, 
I think that the challenges are there and absolutely right, but the glass is definitely half full and not empty. So with all the challenges in front of us and the fact that we depend to a great extent on other countries, that is going to be, but the dependence on Europe, for example, is not going to be the same, in my view, Poland, Europe, than it is today. Just like, for example, European banks, the largest European banks, have actually smaller now impact and volume uh, of business uh, uh, in the world today than it was uh, three, five, seven years ago. It's really changing, the balance is shifting. And I think that because of this inner energy that Alan was talking about, the Polish people, and the fact that they, the Poles actually go very bravely through mental changes, so they are agents of changes, actually I think that the future is going to be quite nice. <laughs>